Well, hi everybody and welcome to the third lecture in the Metabolome Informatics Workshop. We are about to start uh, our tour of XCMS. And before we start, I want to point out that XCMS is software that was created at Scripps Research Institute in La Jolla, California by Gary Susiak's group. And it is uh, a really prime piece of software and it would be really great if one of them could come here to talk about it, but I'm glad to, to do my part for, uh, for Vanderbilt. So we're going to talk about uh, some rather computationally complex issues uh, and how they're addressed within this, this code. And uh, I don't expect after this lecture that you're prepared to write it, but I would like you to at least understand it. So we're, uh, the, the, the hands-on tutorial associated with this is intended for you to get hands-on experience operating it. Um, and hopefully that experience will dovetail well with what we're talking about up here. So uh, we're going to cover three big topics here. Uh, some in closer detail than in others. But uh, we're going to start by finding features by SendWave, move on to mapping major features across experiments, which is kind of one of these necessary steps, and finally, warping retention times using XCMS OB warp. So these are the, the three big operations that take that, uh, that we'll be guiding you through uh, through the first part of the tutorial. We'll talk about differentiation in the, in the next slides, in the slides after this set. So I would point out again that not all metabolome experiments are open-ended, right? If you, if you have a set of metabolites that you know you're interested in, it's probably a lot better to create a targeted quantitation experiment that's designed to, to, uh, to measure those particularly. But if you're doing an untargeted metabolomics experiment, something like XCMS has an awful lot to offer you. So you might be starting with tissue lysates or cells or blood or whatever, uh, and you want to evaluate uh, which metabolites are there, which metabolites are, are, are differentiated, uh, and from that try to dig down into an identity of those. So we, whereas in, in shotgun proteomics we would start by trying to identify everything, we're really going to focus our identification effort on just those things that differ among experiments. So XCMS falls right here in this uh, data alignment and analysis category. It's, uh, it's going to attempt to figure out which ions differentiate the samples without having to know what they are. So yesterday we spent an awful lot of time talking about peak picking. The files that you're working with today have been processed through Proteo Wizard uh, MS Convert, making use of the, um, the can't wait filter for doing peak picking. So I want to point out that in this case we had peaks that were profiled in the, in the raw data, and now we've replaced those with peaks. But that peak picking went one mass spectrum at a time. We also have time persistence for these ions. They don't just show up in a single MS scan and then vanish. They show up in repeated MS scans. And so these features are what we're, we're going to need to detect. And we're going to do it from peak picked data. All right, so that feature recognition is, is finding this persistence property uh, and, and using that to to tie together chromatograms that represent the time-dependent intensity for this ion. From there, we'll talk about retention time alignment. And retention time alignment is a really important factor anytime you're dealing with uh, data as complex as these. The short version is that we need to be able to account for small variations in chromatographic retention times for a, a given metabolite in a given experiment. Otherwise, we can't really compare across these experiments well. Then we'll talk about differentiation. Uh, because uh, the statistics of differentiating are, uh, are rather involved, I, I'm going to give a whole lecture on that subject as we get to the latter part of this afternoon. Uh, and finally, we want to be able to do identification. Uh, and we're going to spend tomorrow on that challenge. How do we, uh, create an, uh, how do we infer an identity from tandem mass spectral data? All right. So XCMS is a big deal. Um, XCMS may have started in Gary's group alone, but it, it's one of those really rare stories that we find in bioinformatics of a tool that's, uh, that's proven useful by one group, really making it out of, the, out of the fold and into a lot of other people's labs as well. One of the ways that they've done that is by creating a service called XCMS Online. Um, XCMS Online is a web server version of the code that we'll be running on, uh, on R on our own laptops. And I have to say, it's a lot nicer. Um, when you, when you don't feel comfortable operating software on, on the command line, essentially, essentially as we do in R, uh, it can really help to have a, a nice, pretty web interface that explains that 
what what BW means, for example, as a as one of the feet, the, the parameters of operation. So uh, I really think it's important if you're going to be doing this a lot, you probably want to make use of XCMS online, which also has the nice benefit of adding a lot of, of capabilities that we don't find in kind of the stripped down version that we've got running in R. Uh, some of that's in visualization, for example. Some of it is in tying to their web servers, so uh, being able to automatically carry through from the XCMS output to, um, to the Metland database to find the identification for something. So uh, this is a very valuable website. The other, the other feature that I think is worth pointing out about this software is that it's not a one paper and then it's done uh, technology. It's really something where they've spent a lot of consistent time all the way from 2006 to, you know, as recently as last year, um, publications that built upon their prior successes. This is one of these marks that you can use to evaluate whether software is growing meaningfully or is kind of a shot in the dark that's no longer maintained. Consistent, uh, consistent work on a, on, a, uh, on a technology tends to make it a lot pe more powerful. So, I've already mentioned features uh, once just by talking about the persistence of a peak at different uh, time slices, at, at different uh, consecutive MS scans. In the paper from uh, 2008, they define a feature as a bounded two-dimensional M over Z in retention time, LCMS signal. So you might imagine that I have a, a square here on the floor. Here's one right here. And now I have M over Z on one axis and I have retention time on the other. So we can imagine this little mountain growing up out of the floor, which is our third axis, intensity. So we're looking for these features that form these little mountains uh, on our little topographic map of the LCMSMS experiment. All right. So. Uh, We've already mentioned that the peak listing is handling this within the plane of a single moment in retention time. We may expect that multiple successive MS scans will feature this, but there's going to be some variance, both in the mass to charge value that's written for the peak that's inferred and for the intensity that we see. Uh, we expect that we're going to have an individual compound represented by multiple peaks. So the first, the first most obvious one is isotopes. You're not going to have just one isotope of this compound showing up. You may have three or four to work from. Uh, we may have multiple charges available, although this is less an issue when we're dealing in very small molecules. Um, it may be that we're running experiments with adducts, in which case the ion may show up um, many, uh, many mass units away from its adductive form. So what we hope to do then is to produce lots of experiments that differ some, somewhat in what metabolites they contain. And we want to be able to map a, a feature found in one file to a feature found in another. Now, if they're technical replicates, we don't expect a huge degree of variation there. We expect the, their intensities to be roughly comparable. The retention times at which they appear should be mostly uh, comparable as well. If that feature is complete, if, if that compound is completely absent in another cohort, though, we may have very, uh, we may have very little intensity for it, or we may just have no, feature, uh, no intensity whatsoever. So when we do this mapping, we need to be able to, uh, to say, we looked in the location where this compound should be found in this experiment, but it wasn't there. Or it was there. So we, we just have to, we have to have the ability to make these mappings among different files. All right. Now, when XCMS was first published in the 2006 article, they used something called the matched filter. Uh, the matched filter was not really designed with uh, high-resolution TOF or high-resolution FT instruments in mind. As a result, uh, they had uh, quite a lot of smearing going on. You might have compounds that were very similar in, uh, in mass to charge and, and retention times that would not be resolved well by these instruments. So matched filter was great for what they could do in 2006. But as time went by, they realized they really needed uh, functionality that was designed explicitly for high-resolution mass analyzers. And that's why they created SentWave in 2008. So 2000, in the, the code for, for SentWave is going to assume that you've already run peak picking on the data. All right, so we've already, we've already passed it through, can't wait, that's already been processed. It expects high-resolution data. Um, and you know, if, you, if you've got really weak resolution, uh, like I say, an early TOF, that may, not, uh, that may not be borne out. Generally speaking, when you're dealing with something like one of these Agilent QTOFs, you've got 
more than enough resolution for this to work with. Uh, so it was freshly published and published separately from this. So when you were, uh, if you were to read only the 2006 article, you might miss out on the on the possible the possibility of using this this newer tool. Um, when we look at which uh, which feature finder gets used in the XCMS online, it tends to be the SentWave one. So I've I've built our demo today around SentWave. All right, what do these data look like when we start digging into them? We see that we have uh, a box, as I mentioned, that we've drawn in two dimensions. We've got our mass to charge dimension that's listed here as 20 ppm wide. And we have a retention time box that in this case is something like 10 seconds wide. So that box uh, defines the, the feature space that this is falling in. We see that at first we have very little intensity for it. It rises rapidly, and then it tails off a little bit. So that's, that's our, our nice chromatographic heat shape. In this case, they're using color to indicate the intensity of these spots. One of the things that, uh, that MaxQuant and other kinds of tools of that type have uh, taken into account is that when you have a very intense signal, you tend to have more mass, accurate, uh, more mass accuracy associated with that ion than when it's down in the grass. And so in this case, we see some wandering around on the, uh, in, in PPM as we are looking at the very head and very tail of, the, of, this, of this peak. But right in the, at the very height of it, we have, uh, we have very accurate mass measurements. All right. That's not going on for just one ionic species, though. In this case, we have four different isotopes that may be seen of this ion. And we need to be able to recognize that those are happening together. So this is one way in which we have to map across multiple features uh, to, uh, to, to recognize kind of a feature group within the data. Now we've talked a bit about wavelets as part of CantWait, uh, our, our software for doing peak picking. That was, a, that was a case where we were trying to match a Ricker wavelet, kind of our, our, the Mexican hat, to a, uh, a feature in a profile. Uh, and that, those profile data rep were, represented, were representing a single MS scan. In this case, we are attempting to find that same shape, the Ricker wavelet again, except this time the, the pattern of intensity that we're trying to match is happening across time rather than across M over Z values. So we've already done our peak picking with the Ricker wavelet in, in the M over Z space. Now we're going to turn that sideways and do it in retention time space instead. So uh, they kind of cheated in this image uh, that I take it from the paper here. We have a, a plot very much like the one we were looking at uh, with can't wait yesterday. These are the uh, these are correlations to Ricker wavelets. But then when they show them superimposed on the chromatograms, they're showing them as Gaussians. So a Ricker wavelet is not a Gaussian, but they're using the the, the correlation values for the wavelets to figure out where to position. These, uh, these, these Gaussians on the data. All right. So why do we do this? What, what's the value here for doing this mapping? We want to say, how much intensity do we have for this particular analyte across all of these experiments? That's great. Now, we haven't done retention time correction yet. And as a result, small variations that occur in, uh, in, in confined regions of retention time are not being accounted for. But our hope is that even though we haven't done that, we're going to have a few intense features that are going to line up reasonably well as we look across multiple files. So uh, our hope then is that we can build our map from the high points that are just kind of can't miss analytes. The really huge things that stick up in lots of files those are going to help us create a rough map that we can use as a starting point. Okay, so the, these intense features are going to be the, the way that we get ourselves to, uh, uh, to the, the, the map we can build, uh, build up more strongly. So this initial course matching that we're producing is, is really depending upon the well-behaved ions to tell us how to deal with the less behaved ones. Imagine if you had, uh, imagine if you had five kids and some of them were a little rowdy, and some of them 
we're you know the, the kids who are always trying to please mom or dad, right? So in a case like that, you might uh, you might find yourself defining good behavior by the kid who's reliably good, and then figuring out how to deal with the others based on how well they're doing. So in the same way, we, we, we have to think about our analytes carefully. Some of them are very dependable in what retention times they appear at, and some of them are downright slippery, and we have to keep an eye out for them. So we're going to do this course matching as a step two, uh, getting a better map for them. So in this case, we are looking at uh, kind of a demonstration data set from, um, just, these are just simulated data, where we have five replicates of A and five replicates of B. In this case, I've, I've used a standard deviation of 15 seconds for our model. So you see that 2,800 seconds is the mean time at which these arrive, uh, but there's some amount of variation. Uh, now, when we, when we look at these in a density plot, we're essentially asking, uh, is, is there like a prime time at which, the, at which most peaks arrive? So on this 15 second standard deviation, we, we, can, we can ask if there are some arrival times that are more popular than others. And this density plot gives us the ability to, to see that. And you can see that our, our density reaches a little above uh, uh, 0.015 here. Now, if I repeat the model, but this time open up our standard deviation to 45 seconds, we now have a, a broader packet, essentially. If we're, if we're trying to map across all of these files, we see that there's a lot more dancing about in terms of which retention time they're arriving at. Correspondingly, we have a lower density that, that is attributed to the, the best time at which we might expect to see these. So a feature like this <coughs> is one that we like in that the arrival times are quite consistent. A, an arrival time like that is much harder for us to deal with. So we have to uh, we'll, we'll, uh, accomplish a lower density by doing so. Oh, I'm sorry, there was one other feature I wanted to talk about on that slide, which is that um, it may be that some of these arrival times fall outside our box. So imagine that we've said uh, that all, fi uh, all, fi uh, all of the files should have features within this 100 seconds. If we've done that, it might be, for example, that this A would fall too, too, too late, essentially, to make it within our box. Uh, if that happens, we're going to have some amount of, of missing data. We have a, a feature that, that we looked for but didn't find within the, uh, the allowable time. As a result, it might fall afoul of our min frac filter. So this is the, the minimum fraction that, um, that XCMS is going to take as a parameter. If you define that a feature must appear in 50% of all of the experiments, uh, one that, that fails to show up in, in at least five will, will not be used for this early mapping stage. So you can set these things too tight and, and lose some of the data that you might otherwise rely upon. So when we try to group features across experiments, um, we have to be very careful about how we parameterize that operation. So the first is M over Z tolerance. If you have a, an instrument that the manufacturer claims can do 10 ppm measurements of ions, and you simply read the book and say, aha, it says it can do 10 ppm, so I'm going to require all precursors to fall within 10 ppm, you're probably going to overestimate the actual uh, performance of the instrument in terms of mass accuracy. Uh, so you can't set that too tight, because otherwise, you may uh, allow some readings of this, uh, of this feature to be left out. So that's not all right. Uh, next, maybe you're really paranoid about liquid chromatography, and as a result, you set up your chromatographic profiles to uh, allow this feature to be matched if it falls within five minutes. Well, if you do something like that, uh, you are going to uh, set yourself up for interferences, that there are other ions that fall with, within roughly the same M over Z value that are a little later or a little earlier that can be mistaken for this ion. Or the software may see that it has a trace at the right time, but it also has a, a, a more intense trace that's two minutes earlier. And it says to itself, well, I'd rather have this nice intense trace rather than the one that's on time. So that, that too is a problem. So when we, when we use mass tolerances and retention time tolerances, we have to be sure that they are reasonable for the data sets we're working. Uh, 
Right. So I've, I've also mentioned that you may have uh, interferences, but some of these interferences are simply biological in nature, and they're not going to be that easy to deal with. You may have something that's simply quite close in uh, mass, uh, and uh, I, I think we, we still feel that uh, Fourier transform instruments resolve better than time of flight instruments. So uh, if, you, if you have a, a very complex mixture to deal with, you may have another feature that's rather too close. Things like that really cause problems for feature finding. And in cases like that, you might have to be very, very restrictive about what mass to charge tolerance and retention time tolerance you allow just to prevent these, uh, these interferences from ma making mistakes in the crude map. Any questions so far? Okay. So this is an example that we get from, uh, from XCMS uh, itself. Uh, so these, these are provided by Gary and uh, H. Paul Benton. So we have parameters that we've provided to the software. This BW thing is going to give us the allowable retention time de deviation in seconds. And then the MZ width is going to tell us how wide a swath in M over Z space we expect this ion to walk across. Now, point 0.1 is pretty huge, right? So that's not something we would typically use for FT data or even high quality top data. But we see that these data are walking back and forth by, by these uh, vertical perturbations in M over Z space, and that we see that they fall within a pretty narrow envelope, really, when we look in retention times in seconds. So they, they all fall within the same two seconds from chromatography. So this, this is a case where we've got a pretty good data set to work with, and we, we end up with a pretty good um, density function resulting from it. So it sees it as a nice feature. All right. So I've been talking about um, these features in, in some abstraction, really. But in fact, the, the causes that lead to having multiple features for a particular iron are varied. Camera is not part of today's demo because we're just doing this with the, um, the basic library, essentially. But if you make use of XCMS online, you'll get, a, you'll get to take advantage of that. So given a pile of, of LCMS data, XCMS will, will handle all of the, um, the alignment and so on, and we get a peak table out of it. Camera is software that helps to reduce that space down to a, a relatively small number of compounds. So, that there's a variety of features that can make use of for doing this grouping. We start with retention time. The notion being that when this ion appears in this experiment, it also appears in, sorry, in, in, in When this ion appears in this, exper in this experiment, there are other related features, such as isotopes, that appear at exactly the same time. We also, and of course we've got isotopes. The software is aware that isotopes exist. Um, there, some of the earliest software that we find in, in fields tends to, to lose some of these, these chemically intuitive things uh, and, and treat each, uh, each species that rises and falls in intensity as an independent thing. Patently, a bunch of ions that are one, dal uh, one Dalton apart are not independent of each other. They, they really do represent an isotopic set. So the software has the ability to annotate them as such. Peak shape also matters. Um, to simply say that we have some intensity at these locations that could be isotopes is not quite as compelling as if all of those traces rise and fall in concert. So to have consistent peak shapes among them is also important. If, if you are aware of adducts that should appear in your sample, you can provide those by a rule table. And those, that rule table can then be applied to recognize, for example, that this ion is found in both silver adducted and non-adducted form. And you may be conducting experiments in, in two polarities. So if you have both positive and negative ion modes, you may be able to stitch those data together to say, this feature that appears in my positive ion scans is also appearing in my negative, uh, negative ion scans. So uh, if, you, if you know something about your experiment and can provide that information through camera, camera will be able to make a more reasonable assessment of what the data look like. All right. The next is that we can make use of principal components analysis. So when we make use of PCA, we're able to recognize that, uh, that related ions tend to lump together uh, in, in PC space. 
we talked a little bit about principal component space in the earlier lecture yesterday. Uh, and the, the notion here is that the, uh, the, the data that are rising and falling in time have, uh, are, are, are strongly correlated signals. As a result, they get grouped together by principal components analysis into the same component. So in this case, we see that a particular ion uh, is found in, uh, in, in uh, a monoisotope and a monoisotope plus one format. Over here, we have sodium add-ups that are also seen for it. And all of these are grouped together as one principal component by PC. Um, and then when we look at this other, vec uh, this, this other component, um, even though it's, um, it's at a, a, a slightly higher M over Z, about six nanoseconds away, um, but it's still able to be grouped uh, separately because it, it varies in a different way across the samples than does the blue set. All right. So with what we've done so far, we've created a rude, kind of crude map of how these data all, uh, all, um, all correspond with each other. The next thing that we want to do is to be able to take into account variations in liquid chromatography. This comes directly from their 2006 paper, and I thought that they hit the nail right on the head. So from this initial grouping, this algorithm has typically identified hundreds of well-behaved peak groups in which very few samples have no peaks assigned. Remember our minimum fraction? And very few samples have more than one peak assigned. That's, that's kind of a bad thing if, if these all have, uh, if, if these five replicates all have one peak associated with a feature and, and this one has multiple mappings, multiple peaks all grouped to the same. That's bad. All right. Such well-behaved groups have a high probability of being properly matched and can be used as temporary standards. Temporary standards. Because the well-behaved peak groups are generally distributed evenly over the significant portions of the chromatographic profile, a detailed nonlinear retention time deviation contour can be built for each sample. All right, now, as you know, I tend to fall back on proteomics when I need to explain something, and so I'm going to do that again here. Temporary standards is an important concept. If I have identified uh, peptides from multiple replicates, one of the things that I can do to draw a map between them is to say that this peptide for albumin was seen at this retention time in this experiment, and it was seen at this retention time in that other experiment. Meanwhile, this peptide for fibrinogen and complement whatever and so on, I've got all these peptides, and in every case I can make a one-to-one -one mapping because they were identified in both experiments. As a result, I can say this time point matches this time point across those experiments. Now, if I identify a peptide in only one of them, it doesn't really help me because I, I don't have anything to, to map it to. I don't have a benchmark over here. So in the same way, in this case, we're going to use uh, these intense peaks, these most intense peaks of the, uh, of the experiments, and map across when we find the same thing appearing elsewhere. Now, if you have a, a, bunch of, uh, a bunch of observances of some ion in all of your A replicates and in none of your B replicates, it doesn't really help you walk between A and B but it may help you stay within A to figure out how to, cor how to correlate those to each other. So these are our temporary standards. All right. Now, next, they make kind of a logical leap, and I, I don't want them to get away with that without our, our exploring it a little bit. Because the well-behaved peak groups are generally distributed evenly over the significant portions of the chromatographic profile. Anyone believe that? They're making a claim here. They're saying that they're going to get a worthwhile model for mapping all parts of the chromatographic profile to other replicates because these well-behaved peaks appear everywhere. I'm going to argue that that's pants. That uh, if you look at the, the primo part of the chromatography, you're going to have lots of well-behaved peaks. But when you're out at the ends, you don't have an awful lot to work with. So you should keep that in mind. This ability to do chromatographic mapping is only going to work if for those, parts of the, uh, for those parts of the experiment where we have enough features to map across. All right, so don't let them slide that one past you. All right, so a detailed nonlinear retention time deviation contour. It's not a great phrase, let's say it together. <laughs> detailed nonlinear retention time deviation contour. All right, this is how you, how you relate the M over Z values from here to the M over Z values from there. A very basic contour to use their word, would be uh, 
let us imagine that I have two experiments, and in one, I, uh, I started the mass spec collecting data and le le left it collecting data without having started my chromatographic run. Maybe I started my chromatographic run one minute later in one case than I did in the other. This is, uh, if everything went otherwise perfectly with the chromatography, we would expect a linear mapping from one experiment to the other. Because basically all we've done is to adjust the, the uh, y-intercept up a little bit on, on one experiment versus the other. And so we have a linear mapping between the two. Not a problem. Similarly, you might imagine that we have shallowed the gradient for one experiment that we didn't for the other. So here we have, say, a 45-minute gradient, and here we have an hour-and-a-half gradient. In something like that, we've, we've not just changed the y, we haven't changed the, the, the y-intercept, we've changed the slope of one versus the other. So you can make a mapping one between those two that's also linear. But what they're arguing is that they have a need for nonlinear modeling. They're saying that they've got some little bubbles of um, unusually high hydrophobicity or unusually low uh, hydrophobicity throughout the, the experiments. So in something like that, uh, we need to have a nonlinear system that can adjust, uh, that can allow for, for fudging back and forth on the hydrophobicity throughout the, the entire gradient. All right. So to do that, they're going to make use of OB warp, uh, which was created by uh, by doc uh, Dr. John Prince uh, out at uh, BYU. Uh, really interesting work. I'm sorry, that actually this came before he was a PhD. I think this may have been his graduate work. Imagine writing one of these as a grad student. All right. So there is a, a fine concept in programming called dynamic programming. Dynamic programming. Uh, is very well known in bioinformatics, largely because of some of the, the really powerful applications that you can find out there for it. So one of these would be sequence alignment. If you are doing a Smith-Waterman alignment of two sequences, you're trying to find what local regions within these sequences are well aligned with each other, pr produce uh, good matches between a pair of sequences. So we could imagine a very, very slow algorithm for this purpose where we grabbed every five letters from one sequence and compared them to every five letters from the other sequence. That would work, but it would also be painfully slow. And what if the, the optimal pattern was actually seven letters long instead of five letters long? Well, you could do that then. But dynamic programming allows us to do uh, a matching of all patterns in A to all patterns in B in a time that's proportional to the square of their two sequence lengths. So that's pretty fast. That's, that's actually extremely fast, much better than this, you know, what five letters from this match to five letters from the other. So dynamic programming is a way that allows us to reach a, um, an optimal alignment of one LCMS experiment to another LCMS experiment in, in a way that is proportional to the number of, in this case, MS scans that we have in each proportional to the, the product of the two. So uh, this is the, uh, which, which parts of this do I really want to cover in close detail? Um, I think I'll talk about this, this additive score matrix part. Imagine that you have an MS scan in uh, experiment A and an MS scan in experiment B. You need to have some way in which you can say, what is the distance between these two MS scans? Okay, so one of the ways that you could do this um, would be a dot product. We'll talk about dot products a little bit tomorrow. Uh, which is to say that you're going to line these two MS scans on top of each other, and you're going to store the product of intensity as you move from low M over Z's to high. It's just a way that basically says if, if, in, if you've got intensity located at the same locations in these two spectra, you're going to reward it. If they have intensity in opposite locations in these two spectra, you're going to, you're going to punish that. All right, so now we have a scoring function that allows us to relate any mass spectrum from A to any mass spectrum from B. Is that part pretty straight for everybody? Okay, so we, we can accept that we can, we can put a number on two scans and say, are they similar or are they dissimilar? That's great. Now, we have to do some amount of work to, to find the... Uh, the best match between these scan, between these two files. Imagine that I compare every MS scan from the A experiment to every MS scan from the B experiment. That's a lot of comparisons, isn't it? 
So that's, that tells me the best possible match for any one uh, spectrum in A to any one spectrum in B. But it doesn't tell us how we can accomplish most of those, right? Because if you've already said that scan 1,000 is mapped to scan 1,000, you can't then go on to say that scan 1,200 is mapped to scan 800, right? They need to be in, in time order. So essentially, as we walk through this pair of, uh, these, this pair of chromatographic profiles, we can either say, we're going to accept these two as matches, or you can say, we're going to skip this one on the right, or you can say, we're going to skip this one on the left. So if you have only those three options every time you walk through, you have a limited number of, of uh, best matches that you can accept. That's what all this wandering back and forth is about. The software is trying to find the optimal path of skip that spectrum or skip the other. Uh, if, if you move horizontally, you're skipping a spectrum in. Uh, in this file, if you move vertically, you're skipping a spectrum in that file. And so it's going to try to find the best way to wiggle back and forth between these these two uh, these two experiments to prove uh, to provide an optimal alignment, one that gives us the best uh, the best kind of accumulation of best uh, MS versus MS scores. Okay, so I'm not really going to go into much more detail than that, but this is called OB warp, and it's it's how it's done. Uh, within the XCMS online uh, document. So I would note that this is another paper from 2006, but this is not the paper uh, that uh, introduced the original XCMS. This is a tool that was created by this computer scientist in conjunction with them. So Obi Warp was adopted early on and it has uh, proven uh, great, great value. So that was a lot of work, right? I mean, doing this doing this mapping from one to the other and finding an optimal path through the pair of files uh, takes effort. So we need to know that we've accomplished something by that. So we start by accounting for run-to-run -run liquid chromatography variability. Um, if, we, if we do this in this, uh, in this carefully designed way, we're able to account for variation to the best extent we can. Dynamic programming is a very fast way to go about finding these optimal uh, these optimal walks through the data as well. So there are, uh, there are alternative methods that one can use for producing these paths, but dynamic programming has really kind of owned the space of aligning one LC to another. Uh, now, we've already talked a little bit about how we could do linear fitting among pairs of files. And it is true that linear fitting can accomplish an awful lot of what we would like to look for. But it's not really going to give us these micro-heterogeneity uh, fixes along the way. So the small time scale variances are why we really need to have uh, a nonlinear mapping between pairs of files. So when we use XCMS, uh, there are several several rules that they've put that they've set out that I think are useful ones for us to follow. First off, before you send data to the XCMS software, it makes a lot of sense for you to look at it using systems like MS Picture. Um, so you can visualize the raw data before you start. That may save you an awful lot of hassle in dealing with data that you would, you would have recognized are faulty from the get-go. Next, if you're using XCMS on your own computer, write down your R scripts. Now, if you're doing something like RStudio, this is probably happening by default on, along the way. Um, in, in my case, I've written down on, uh, on my text file what I did at each step. That, too, uh, will get you by. And when you publish a paper, feel free to put that document that explains what you did in R into the sub sub uh, supporting information. There are lots of people out there who would like to be able to repeat what you've done to confirm it. And if you don't provide your R code, you're necessarily going to leave out a lot of information they need to repeat your, your steps. So by all means, include it. Save your objects. Um, R gives us the ability to save our workspace, which stores everything, uh, all of the variables that we've uh, got in place, all of the libraries we have open, and so on. But you can just save the documents that you've created from these uh, computationally complex steps that we're doing to the hard disk right away, and just open those right up off the, off the drive. It does make sense to optimize your workflows. Uh, just because the, uh, the website thinks that QTOFs should be processed with 50 ppm uh, measurements does not mean that your instrument is, is uh, that good or that poor, depending on how you look at it. So um, optimize them uh, to reflect the kind of instruments that you have 
and the kind of workflows that you're operating. If you're using a, uh, a 15 minute separation of metabolites, it probably doesn't make sense to use the long uh, retention time blocks that you would if you were doing a three hour separation. All right, keep in mind, if you feed the software bad stuff, you're gonna get bad stuff back. So no software can, no software can, uh, can fix experiments that are, are deeply flawed from the get-go. And if you, if you have data of which you are unsure and, uh, and your QC assessment thinks it's kind of suspect, you probably will do better to just replace it if you can. All right, so with that, we come to the takeaway messages. So if you're going to find biomarkers using XCMS, I'm, I'm calling them biomarkers, but they could be chemical differences, whatever. We don't need to uh, call it clinical testing yet. Um, XCMS must first reduce the retention time variability, uh, which allows us to increase the comparability among different experiments to account for these little variations in LC. Ions with high signal to noise act as landmarks to relate these experiments in the first step. Based on that initial map, we can, we can uh, correct our retention time and then produce a much higher alignment of features across experiments. Compounds may be found in multiple isotopes, charge dates, and attic variants. The software on the website, uh, using camera, will let you spot the, uh, will let you associate those together. I believe it is possible in some way to run camera on your own computer. Um, I don't know how that's set up with the R package, but I'm, I'm sure we can figure it out if we need to look into it. Uh, 